Welcome to my Claim Your Worthiness podcast, Intimate Conversations with Gail Jones. We all have a safe place within to create anew. In each episode, I hope to add to your inner sanctuary to strengthen the belief in yourself and your dreams. Claiming our worthiness sets the foundation for centering us back into our greatness. From this foundation, we create our most amazing lives. I'll be sharing insights and resources from my own journey and from others who are transforming their lives. Lean in and receive the wisdom shared. You are worthy of having this special time with yourself. Hello, I'm Gail Kernan-Jones, host of the Claim Your Worthiness podcast. Thrilled to be here today with my guest, Anthony Abagnano, who will be offering us powerful insights and techniques to calm and heal ourselves during these anxious times. Anthony lives in Tuscany, Italy, where he and his wife are building a community named ASHA, which stands for Alchemy School of Healing Arts. You can find out more information about it at asha.global. Anthony is considered by many who have participated in his breathwork trainings to be a visionary thought leader. Anthony is considered by many who have participated in his breathwork trainings to be a visionary thought leader. He uniquely combines philosophy and psychology with spirituality to guide others in loving ways using conscious breathwork as one of the many foundational tools. He is the founder of Alchemy of Breath, which offers free online breathing sessions every Sunday with participants from all over the world. To learn more, check out alchemyofbreath.com. He also has a book in development to be released next year, and we're going to be sharing some snippets from that book today, a lot of wisdom. Anthony has guided more than 100,000 people through different breath practices. Many report an experience of oneness during and after a breath session. This oneness can be interpreted as a connection with the divine, the superconscious, or the quantum field. And I just want to say before we get into a little bit more of his introduction as well, that this isn't just breath work. It's really a transformational healing process that Anthony really brings us through. So if you're thinking of just sitting and breathing in your own, this is a very different process. It really takes us into deep levels, and he'll be sharing more later. And it's really an unbelievable tool for these transition times in our lives right now. A couple other tidbits about Anthony that are kind of fun. He is the nephew of Italy's most famous philosopher, Nicola. That exposure led Anthony to weave philosophy into many other healing approaches that he uses in his breath work, conscious loving skills, hypnotherapy, matrix energetics, which is a study of miracles. He has taken his breath work to festivals, yoga spaces, the corporate world, prisons, hospitals, and to the dying. His work is especially noted for its application in the fields of addiction, transformation, personal empowerment, integration of psychotropic and plant medicine experiences, and the opening of humanity's hope for a hot-scented, harmonious existence. So, Anthony, welcome. So thrilled to have you. And before we begin to dig deep into your breadth of expertise, I'd love if you could just share with us a personal story of claiming your own worthiness or a couple stories of how you claimed your own worthiness and how you bring that to your work today. First of all, thank you, Gail. Thanks for this wonderful chance to be with you. And I'm going to take a breath before I begin Excellent. and see what it is that wants to be spoken. Hmm. And that question is not how did I come to the breath, but to give you some kind of idea of its transformational power in my life, in my understanding, Understanding you correctly. And um, because my podcast is called Claim Your Worthiness, I'd love to know if you would share a personal story about how you had to claim your own worthiness. Okay, this is a little edgy, but here we go. I was on Ibiza several years ago. I used to live on the island of Ibiza. And I had one of my students, a protege of mine, who's now a teacher with us at Alchemy of Breath, and he came to visit me. And I'd been working in Ibiza for a couple of years, and I lived in a house that was on top of a cliff overlooking the sea. It was very isolated and deserty. And I had a 
dog who I still have now. Um, and we used to walk every day. But we were so isolated that we got used to being, my wife and I got used to being naked. There was nobody to overlook us. There was no house within five or 10 miles. So we got used to living with nature that way. And we'd go pick fruit every morning and eat it from the trees. And I started to take my dog for a walk naked. And when Pablo came to visit me before we did a retreat in Ibiza, I, I said to him, look, I've got this new practice that I've taken up and I call it naked walking. And it's scary because I'm walking down the drive driveway and you don't know what might happen but there's also something very beautiful about it that you feel so close to nature there's not even a piece of clothing on and almost like being a caveman it's so elemental it's almost like being a caveman or something so he said hey i'll go for that and so our first walk we walked down the driveway together like little kids giggling a bit and mm -hmm. feeling a bit self-conscious and we started to talk and we were sharing deeply. We hadn't seen each other for a long time. And uh, as we walked, we forgot how far we were walking. We walked over halfway to the village. We must have walked mm -hmm. two or three kilometers and getting more and more comfortable doing this. And then all of a sudden, two German people came cycling on mountain bikes up this little dirt path that we were walking on. And our first reaction was to jump behind this little rosemary bush and try cover ourselves up and pretend we weren't there. Uh -huh. And being German, and they're quite used to nakedness, the Germans, they just cycled past and went, good Morgan, and just kept on going. But Pablo and I were both frozen in this moment of shame and giggling from this place of shame. And so we crept out from the bushes and stood in the roadway again and giggled and had tears in our eyes. And there was something really sad there. There was something really sad there because what were we ashamed of? We were in the middle of nowhere. Why would we feel it necessary to hide our nakedness? And... We decided, I being in a, having been the victim of this situation, we've got to make a clear choice in order to restore our sense of self-worth again. We need to make a choice, and that's what we forget to do when we're traumatized, right? When our sure. inner child is wounded like we were, that the whole brain stops functioning. So I said to him, we've got to make a choice. And he said, okay, why don't we walk back because we know they're going to have to cycle back down again it's a dead end and we'll walk back home now and if we see them we're just going to stand tall mm -hmm. and we're not going to cover ourselves up we're just going to stand tall and we'll wave them by excellent anthony when you had that moment of feeling the shame and then reclaiming it was there anything that linked back to an earlier you talked about the inner child which we're going to get to later and a lot of people might not understand what that is yet but that shame as an adult, did it link back to a time earlier in life when you didn't feel worthy? Yeah, it did. Okay. And, and, and it actually linked back to a particular experience I had as a seven-year-old boy in my first week of being at boarding school in England when three of us as kids pulled our pants down and showed each other who we were. We were like, oh, look at you and look at me. It was this experimental child thing. And we were caught. Mm -hmm. And I got beaten. And that was, of course, what this was all about. Okay. That was who it was that had been shamed mm -hmm. so long ago, so, 62 years ago. So it's amazing how long these feelings of unworthiness can stay in our bodies. Even no matter how much healing we've done, we can still get triggered by feelings of unworthiness going forward, right? <sighs> yeah, this is where it gets real, huh? When we get to realize that the person that's hurting in this moment is actually someone that's been carrying that hurt for years, even decades. Mm -hmm. So in that journey to reclaiming worthiness and reclaiming the innocence that we are, it does mean identifying the lack of worthiness first mm -hmm. to be able to bridge that gap. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk later about how breath work can be helpful for that and many other things. But before we get into your deep work and all your wisdom you've shared with hundreds of thousands of people, can you just give us an overview of how you see the bigger reason for the challenges we're facing now in the world, the spiritual reasons that we may be called to deal with these challenges? 
Yeah, I I would love to speak to that. From one point of view, it's about miracles and what we cast into remote possibility because we consider miracles something that can't happen to us. And it's also about where we've just visited. It's about the inner child that's not been taken care inside of us and has learnt to cope with traumas in ways that were designed usually between the age of one and seven. So they're not very functional now. They're out of date. But from more of a spiritual perspective, we don't believe that we're walking miracles. We tend to think that we're not worthy. That's one of our fundamental beliefs is that I don't belong and I'm not good enough and I'm not worthy. And that's, of course, because we gave our power away at a young age. We couldn't feed ourselves. We had to be taken care of. And along with that caretaking came messages from the world or our family or peers or or even parents that created to that self-diminishment that we learned to live with. And in order to be good, I have to do it someone else's way. In order to get love, I have to do something that I'm not doing now. I can't be natural and abundant and joyful and loud and noisy as I am now. The spiritual perspective is that we're not worthy because we don't recognize our worthiness. But if we think of how many trillion of sperm need to be produced in order for one life to be born, somewhere over 35 trillion sperm, then who's to say we're not a miracle? This is a one in 35 trillion chance that we would even be born. And this is where a lot of my work with miracles is understanding that miracles are not remote. They're happening all the time. They're happening right now. The problem is that we don't give the attention, the right kind of attention we need to give in order to notice these things. And that was just an example because we think of ourselves as unworthy, but actually we've been chosen to be here. I'm just curious if because of the world conditions now and the challenges going around the world that we're all facing, if you feel that this is a calling to go inward or it's harder to go inward, or are you encouraging people to shift off the external circumstances and come back to finding the miracle who they are within? What Are you, are you doing anything differently now because of the challenges going on in the world? I think it's more urgent because of the challenges that are going on in the world. But no, it's the same task, and it is an inside job. If you think that we needed a nipple to suck on to get fed or and how that's developed in our life, we have learned to externalize both our problems and our solutions. And in order to reclaim an ability to respond or to play with words, to reclaim responsibility, we need to take the power back. We need to look at what can happen inside our beings that can then change our lives. And so I believe it's a really a two-way street, as Bruce Lipton said in his book, biology of belief, we can certainly be affected by our environment. Our cellular structure is alert and susceptible to our outer environment. And some of us would also be willing to um, subscribe to my outer world reflects something about my inner world. Mm -hmm. So in my, my wife or my primary relationships, I'm getting mirrors given to me to have a look at my inner world. I posit also, therefore, that our inner world is influential on our outer world. And we know that in our behavior. We've abdicated our position of being leaders in life, but actually we're leading people all the time. Everybody we see or touch or come in contact with is influenced by our presence in one way or another. So this aspect of the miracle is that we've abdicated from that possibility. We're used to giving the power to the doctor or the television program or to shopping or whatever coping system that we might have created to feel okay, but we've lost the distinction between what gives us temporary relief and what actually can really create resolution. And I believe resolution is born from inside us, not outside us. There's two particular quotes I um, love from your book. And again, your book won't be coming out till next year, but we're going to share some glimpses of it today. And one of them, I love this, you say, each breathwork session is a hero's journey into uncharted territory. Whether our lives are littered with trauma or peaceful sanctuaries, whatever emotions encountered or our understandings achieved, our challenge is to bring them back intact to an imperfect world. 
Breathwork is one of the best ways to unleash ourselves from the limitations of the past. When we bring our problems and issues to a session of breathwork, we bring them to the altar of our existence. It doesn't take a lifetime for this to happen. It takes minutes. That's why breathwork is one of our greatest gifts and most useful tools. It's always been our greatest resource. And it's free. Yeah. yeah. And so could you just talk a little bit, like for somebody that isn't familiar with breath work and they're feeling a little anxious right now during these times, what breath work can do for them? Yes. It, well, it actually all begins with breath awareness. And the only time that we're used to being aware of our breath is when we lose it, right? When we don't have enough or we get threatened and it stops. So the awareness that I'm speaking of is r massive in comparison to the amount of attention we give to it. So that awareness, for example, just a simple example is that if you breathe in, you notice your body goes up. But there's no reason that inhaling should make your body go up. It, your lungs expand 360 degrees and, and, and up and down and sideways and backwards and forwards. So if you breathe, just take a breath right now and feel how you can experience your ribs opening to the side and opening to the back as well, instead of just the belly and the front and the top of the chest. That's one awareness that we don't normally have. And just giving your breath, your awareness, changes something so significant that you're taking the time to become aware of something that you've taken for granted your whole life. Just that is half the task. So as we feel stress and we feel pressure from these times, all the more important it is to create space in which we can foster our own consciousness in this human mess. And as much as a dear student said to me the other week, you can't screw up being human. And part of our humanity is also our inhumanity. We see it around us also all the time. But what we can do if we can bring our consciousness to our breath is we can make that first step to creating an oasis in the chaos. And then once we've created that space, when we have the emotional leadership to breathe in the face of trial or tribulation, then we have a mind that can actively create and we can make choices, which takes us out of our victim role. We right. become more the creator of our life. You use in your Sunday free breath sessions, and again, those are people from all over the world. I've attended them for a couple of years, and they're just amazing healing experiences. You use the conscious connected breath. Can you just explain to our listeners how that's different than if we're just sitting at our desk breathing for those who may never experience like really focusing on the continuous breath as you do? Yeah, we use this breath because it's perhaps the most potent example of what can happen in a short period of time. And a conscious connected breath means not stopping. You don't pause at the top of your inhalation or at the bottom of your exhalation. And it just sounds, it's a paradox. It sounds so ridiculously simple that something like this could have such profound effects on us, both in terms of our physical condition and also our psycho-spiritual awareness too. But it has happens very quickly within five or six breaths if we breathe in a nice rich inhale uh, five or six of those i even just after three i begin to feel a slight disorientation from what i would consider my normal world mm -hmm. and What's actually happening as we increase the oxygen levels in our blood is we're beginning to slow down the frontal lobe a little bit. We begin to think in a different way as a result of slowing down that motor mind, that monkey mind that's got these, as the Buddhists say, 60,000 thoughts an hour a, a day. We begin to slow those down and then something's happening in the gap. Something else can be noticed. And that's often what the body wants to tell us. When we think of 20% of the messages go from brain to body and 80% go from body to brain, why don't we listen to the body more? And Can what you does give that the statistics mean? again, Anthony? 80% of the messages go from the body to the brain. 
That's correct. Okay. The body is sending more messages to the brain than the brain is sending to the body. There's a tremendous resource here that we don't use. Here's an example. Your heart emanates an electrical field that's about 30 to 50 times wider, has 30 to 50 times more reach than your brain. So that means if you're sitting on a train next to somebody, your heart field, your energy field, your electrical field from your heart is overlapping with somebody else's. And that's why we get intuitions and feelings about people when we meet them, we feel a sense of resonance or a sense of caution or somewhere in between. But of course, we give the brain the credit for that. But actually, our body's talking to us. Another example is our gut. We have expressions like gut feeling, and we use it sometimes. But do we actually, every time we have to make an important choice, do we check into the gut? No, we give the brain the credit and we rationalize and we right. make lists of one right. side or the other, but we don't follow that gut instinct, the gut intuition. So the conscious breath work is actually giving us space to listen to our body. That's right. Uh, and can you just also explain like on the Sunday sessions that typically 30 minutes, what's the significance of 30 minutes? Does that get them to a deeper place? Is it that we're uh, tuning into the collective energy of people around the world? What is the reason for 30 minutes of the breath? There's no reason for 30 minutes other than the feasibility of doing it and to give people a taste of it to introduce them. It's an introduction that's right. happening every week. Right. And you'll see there are many new people joining every week. You could do it for 10 minutes. My students who are training to be facilitators, they do, as a morning practice, they do 28 connected breaths, which is about three minutes. And then they write for 10 minutes. And that's a, a morning practice that I recommend to anybody who's at least breathed with us on a Sunday. Please breathe with us first. Don't just do it on your own. Mm -hmm. There are counterindications, so you need to know what they are. Mm -hmm. But even just three minutes of a connected breath and then free writing, so that's like automatic writing where you take your pen or your keyboard and you don't stop. You don't worry about the rubbish that you're writing. If you can't think of what to say, you just write, I can't think of what to say mm -hmm. and repeat it until something else comes through. And there's an extraordinary process that begins when you do that, an awakening that is revealed over, say, a few days, right. and you look back at what you've written and you begin to understand things that you've never really even thought of before. What I have found so profound about using breath work as part of a healing practice is a lot of healing, coaching, it doesn't bring the body into it. You can intellectualize what you're releasing, and we're going to talk a little bit about the inner child work and how you reparent that inner child. But when the body's brought in, it can feel immediate release. It can feel immediate healing. It can release trauma of decades versus all the talking. Would you agree? Yes, I would. Absolutely. I think it's a yes and. If we can harmonize these two and get them to work together, then we have a team. Mm -hmm. And the team makes the dream. So uh, we can release trauma with the body. The body knows how to release trauma. And involuntary shaking that would normally occur after a trauma is usually suppressed. If you've been in a car accident or something of that nature, the uh, medics are going to strap you down because they're concerned you might break something or you might do your organs more damage. But actually, if you look in the animal kingdom, what happens after an animal has been traumatized is they go into an involuntary shake. And that is the release of the trauma. And it's quite possible that they might just stand up and run off again afterwards, as the breath that we use really helps the body speak, not just to the mind, but to actually conduct this sort of release. But unless the mind is attuned to it, then the next time we're triggered, that is the next time that the trauma or the memory of the trauma is activated by an outside circumstance, then those same chemicals, the, the cortisol, mm -hmm. the adrenaline, surge through the body again. And that will mean that, that the trauma will return into the body again. So if we that's why we use the conscious connected breath not just for physical release right. but also for understanding things in a different way anthony i know many have worked with you consider you a great healer and, and as, as me as a coach we both um 
really value the inner child work. And yeah. Even my experience in training in neuroscience and clear intentions and elevated emotions is how we change. But I still always believe you have to go back to that inner child because that inner child is still part of the journey, right? No matter how elevated we get our emotions. So can you just explain to us a little bit, how would you define inner child for our listeners who may never have done this? We are the product of our experiences and the subconscious mind gets pretty much filled by the time we're seven or maybe latest eight years old. And so each choice we made, each impact that we've suffered or, or shock or trauma or abuse or whatever it might have been, will have frozen us. Part of the reaction to trauma is a freeze, fight or flight. And of course, what happens to your breath when that happens is your breath stops. You're <clears throat> in shock. Each time that happens... And it doesn't have to be a car accident or something awful. It could be something that stimulates shame, like seeing your parents making love and them slamming the door or something seemingly unimportant to us as adults. But each of these incidents separates us from our wholeness. In other words, the part of us that is impacted becomes frozen and learns how to cope, immediately seeks a coping system to stay calm and carry on or right. to compensate or whatever that might be. Now, that usually has a shadow side and a plus side. So for me, example, my example is as, as a kid, my family was very outward facing. I was in England, put into boarding school. Children were meant to be seen and not heard. And we were marginalized as kids. As a result, I build community. That was my positive way of coping. I would always go try to get people to come together as a child. Right. And I still do it now. Why? But I do it. Yeah, exactly. But I do it consciously. But usually these incidents have a negative effect on us. And as Richard Schwartz says, who has uh, founded something called Internal Family Systems, the tragedy of this is that this part of us gets isolated and gets mm -hmm. left behind because it's been cauterized. It's been shocked. So when you think of all of those incidents that have happened during those seven years of life, and even other ones later can still affect our subconscious, there are millions of parts of us that have they've been fragmented, they've been left behind. Mm -hmm. So inner child work is really about how do we reclaim that part of us that got stuck behind the damage? Sure. Are there any specific words you recommend to people as they, a lot of times with my client, I know you, you do it as well. I have them have a picture of their inner child, zero to five usually, and they talk to their inner child. And I, But are there any specific words you suggest people say to their inner child? There's a relationship to be built, first of all. And to make it as brief as possible, that child probably doesn't trust the outer world and it probably doesn't trust you until you've proven your worth. So there's a relationship to be built. I had a psychotherapist client who'd been, been a therapist for 30 years, and I talked to her about inner child work, and she said, I've done all of that. I, I don't need to do that anymore. I've done all that kind of work. And, and I said, why would you put the most important relationship in your life back in the closet? Why on earth would you think you're done? Because I believe this is the most more important than my relationship with my wife or my children is the restoration of these parts of myself that have been abandoned and left behind. Right. And they come up in major turning points in your life, too. I remember when I was on TV for the first time with my worthiness platform, even though intellectually I was all prepared, I had to uh, comfort my inner child that it was going to be safe no matter what anybody said or did that I was going to be safe in that moment. Do you agree yeah. with that? That, that it, it's... Ab Absolutely. I have my on my Facebook page is a picture of my inner child. I have a teddy bear by my bed. <laughs> I have a photograph. I have all the knickknacks, all the props I can gather to remind me that this is a part of who I am. Right. I love this um, quote from your book. Again, I'm sharing a, a sneak preview. Much of our suffering is actually the little one inside, a person who is in despair. Every time we suffer a trauma, a part of our psyche is likely to become fragmented from our awareness. No coping system can assuage the pain of an unresolved, fragmented inner child, even though we might have devised ways and personas to cope or interface with the world outside of us. So this inner child's with us forever. 
Gosh, I hope so. I think it was Mr. Rogers who said, my inner child is in me still, and sometimes he's not so still. And because if we don't resolve this, we become like children in adult forms and adult bodies. So you trigger me and I get upset. So I defend myself in my old coping way and I upset you. And is it any wonder that we see debates on the political stage that are basically children in adult bodies arguing things that are not really about helping the world. And you've explained this so well before, Anthony, so I wonder if you could just clarify. Some people criticize the inner child work saying, and I know you do it differently, so I'd love if you could just explain this, that it gives too much power to the child and not the adult that we are. So I'm wondering if you could just explain by becoming a more empowered adult that we are actually reparenting that inner child or how do we stay in the power of the adult? I, I think that statement couldn't be, honestly, I don't think it could be less accurate. I think the truth is that the inner child takes over if we don't develop a relationship with it. Right. It acts out through us. So you wound me and my inner child is wounded. I, I might be cruel to you as a result of that because he's so wounded. So I think the the absolute opposite. Here's an example. If you imagine you're walking into a musical, a, a, a classical concert in this wonderful music hall, and you're early and you can hear all of the musicians tuning up their instruments and the oboes making its noise and the guitar and the drums and the piano, they're all the violin, they're all making, they're all trying to tune up and get ready for the concert. But they're not listening to each other. They really have to listen to their own instrument to understand what's going on. And it sounds like a mess. It sounds like a cacophony of sound. But when the conductor walks in and he raises that baton and he starts the music, it's enough to make tears flow or give you goosebumps. It's so impressive, the unity that's occurred. And I love this analogy because what happens with those fragmented parts of us, they don't talk to each other. Mm -hmm. they're, like those, they're like those musicians just polishing their tool, their coping system, but there's nobody conducting the show. Here's the deal. How can you really know that I am who I am if all these fragments have been left behind in my past and I'm this composite of coping systems presenting myself to you as somebody authentic? It's not who I am. Who I am is all the damaged bits too and, and my efforts to heal them. So do we want to be the conductor of our own lives or do we want to have this cacophony going on, playing out through us? That's really the question. Right. So most of the times when we're highly charged or reactive, it's really our inner child? Yeah, I've never found it traced it can be traced to anywhere else, I'm afraid. I keep trying, but right. I wish there was a simpler way, but but I've never found a way. So a lot of the world right now is in, in, in overreaction. So is there anything you would, other than the conscious collective breath, you would recommend to somebody to calm that little, that inner child when they're getting bombarded with the news every day and the changing circumstances? What can they say to that inner child right now to help that inner child feels sick. of course things like this are better done as a practice or preventatively sure. than in reaction but the first choice is to take three breaths if you can take three breaths you've opened the door to your own emotional leadership you've opened the door to possibility three so breaths. even if someone sorry three breaths opens the door to our emotional leadership that's brilliant i love that Ex that actually came from a student. I have to give dear Julian credit for that. He just said it in one of our one of our talks recently, and I just love it. it. It's buying you time. And if someone's hurt you and you say, excuse me, I've just got to take three breaths. I'm feeling triggered. You can imagine that things might be starting to happen for them too, because that's quite surprising. That's not what normally happens. Normally, I'd give some quick answer and slap back or something or, or become crumple and become a victim. But here I'm demonstrating to myself and to people who are willing to notice that I do have emotional leadership. I'm not just going to be thrown around by my emotions. Sure. And that three breaths can become 10. I can say, hey, I need another 10. It's all good. This is all good. And the system that I've devised is something that I call the bridge. And it's a practice that takes about uh, half an hour, 40 minutes with each client that I use it with. And afterwards, they can use it themselves. And it can be refined into a practice that literally can be three breaths.
Mm-hmm. And that first first breath is just to breathe, to create space. Second breath is to inquire where I'm feeling this in my body and to realize that this belongs to a past part of me, a little child inside. And then the third breath is really to gather that child back into my heart again and to let him know that he's safe. I can do this. I've got your back. Excellent. You talk a lot in your book about accessing our feelings, and uh, you say a successfully guided breath session, breath work session, can enable the release of a wealth of blocked emotions, which promotes the breather's connection to a deeper sense of self, dissolving multiple layers of protection, skepticism, and disbelief. At first, yeah. this can be surprising. The wellspring has been tapped, feelings burst forth, and the breather can experience a new sense of aliveness and vulnerability. Can you talk a little bit more about how important it is for us to access those feelings to come alive and be our most vibrant Uh, selves? Yeah, this is so fundamentally important to humanity. We claim to be sentient beings. Sentire means to feel in Latin. We claim to be sentient beings, but we go around hurting each other like crazy. We've turned to pills, doctors, sex, shopping, alcohol, addiction, whatever it might be in order to stop ourselves feeling. And so breathwork is about reclaiming our ability to feel. And that means feeling the good stuff, the ecstatic stuff, and it also means feeling the challenges too. If we cannot allow ourselves to feel sadness and loss, We lose the muscle with which we can feel abundance and joy. So we need to learn to do this. And breath is one of the simplest, quickest ways that can happen. Here's an example. If you're crying like a baby, like you used to when you were a kid, you remember that? (laughs) You get into this cycle and this rhythm that it's actually rather tempting, right? It's something cathartic about it. And it feels like it has its own momentum. It actually takes some willpower to stop it. If you breathe at the same time, and you allow those feelings to be there, something magical happens. At first, it's you start sobbing, and then you stop and you take three breaths, and then you go back to sobbing again, and you stop and you take maybe four breaths. And then after a while, you can actually breathe a slow breath and still have the intensity of the feeling. Know that this is so deeply healing because you're uniting things that have been kept separate for a lifetime. And it's also ecstatic. Even if it's sadness that you're feeling, if you breathe into that sadness and allow it to be there, there is such beauty in that moment if we can allow both to be in the same place. Excellent. Excellent. I want to talk more about intimacy with feelings and true self. Uh, not just releasing the emotions, but how do you feel more connected to yourself by through this process? Your true um, self, the higher consciousness. The- I think the ingredients, the mathematics of it, the, sim- the, the more fundamental aspects are if I slow down my monkey mind, it gives me a chance to be aware of other things. If I'm going to be inspiring myself, if I'm bringing in air, and I'm inspiring, which means to bring in spirit. I'm bringing in an element of consciousness that is m- the most subtle we could possibly ach- achieve. It's awareness. It's just pure awareness, consciousness. And I'm bringing it into this carnal manifestation of flesh that I can touch. So the reunion of these two things is, is where the magic lies. How does it differ than meditation when we bring in higher consciousness and we're sitting quiet? How does does breath work amplify it? Yeah, for me, it it multiplies it. Yeah, almost quantum. Yeah, it's very similar to meditation. And I would call it like turbo meditation. It's like a rocket, like rocket fuel meditation, because only 10 breaths can begin to change your point of view, whereas with meditation, it may take hours uh, or breaths. days. 10 breaths can change your point of view. 10 breaths can change your point of view. Wow. And is that the conscious connected breath? Uh, definitely conscious mm-hmm. connected breath. But honestly, even one breath can take your point of view. Just that emotional, just taking, making that choice to take one conscious breath is going to change the way you view things. Right. 
So if somebody is in therapy or coaching, this can really accelerate their journey doing the breath. Indeed, yeah. We have many coaches, psychotherapists, and other healing practitioners that, that study this work with us for that reason, yeah. Yeah, um, psychotherapists say, gosh, 20 years of therapy, and it's all sorted in an hour. You sure. know, now I get it. Sure. Well, I send um, all my clients to your Sunday breath work, and they oh. all found it profound, the co- yeah. being in the collective and bringing the body into the journey. No matter what is happening in our world now, know this. You are not your circumstances. Learn how to claim your internal power to thrive. In Gail's six-session coaching package, Creating a New Mindset for Thriving. Discover your hidden beliefs that hold you back. Learn empowering words and feelings that shift your mindset to create anew. Release financial setbacks and other blocks to abundance. Step into a new vision for your life with clearly defined action steps to support it. Be championed and mentored, which is a key to success. Email her at gailjones at claimyourworthiness.com to set up a complimentary 30-minute session to learn more. Gail trained with world-renowned neuroscientists to help you learn to train your brain for optimal outcomes. Check out her website, claimyourworthiness.com, especially her video on the homepage, to catch a glimpse of her expertise. Anthony, you also work closely with those with addictions and those who are dying. And can you explain how your work has helped those with addictions? Yeah, breathwork is all about connection. It's connection with your own body, connection with your own awareness, connection with your own soul and your own loving being. And an addiction is all about disconnection. It it heals addiction because of that. And there's other work as well, like addiction is also a lot of inner child work involved with addiction for me, with the people that I work with. I think the other things that come with breathwork are an ability to tap the well of compassion that we have, the well of forgiveness that we have, and the understanding that we actually do belong. So again, if connection is the issue with addiction, then the breath can really help. I have many addicts that have breathed with me and some who've studied with me and now work with addiction in prisons and and elsewhere because this is such a quick way to sort it out. Again, inner child work is going to need to be involved in there, but the the concept of self-forgiveness that we cast away from us and we feel such guilt and shame, which really isn't ours to carry, you know, in, in a breathwork session, we get to separate these ingredients and not make them just ours, but to go into more of an observer place and understand as these feelings pass through that they will pass, so we don't need to attach to them so much. I just want to pick up on you said with the belonging piece with the addiction. I think many of us in this world right now are feeling extremely isolated, separated from family. So can you just elaborate a little bit more on how breathwork can help them have a sense of belonging to themselves when they're isolated from their loved ones that they can't see? Or how Just to address a little bit more on belonging, because I think that's the trigger for a lot of people right now. They're not feeling like they belong or can be with the people they quote unquote belong with. Yeah. I, first of all, want to just recognize that as part of our human condition and how tragic this all is, that this is happening. And when I hear you speak, I just feel that need that we have for this this intimacy that is not permitted by somebody else at this point, or at least it appears that way. I do also feel that something as simple as... Even on screen, looking at someone as they breathe and letting them look at you as you breathe, because you can't look in the camera and see them. You can only, you have to look down a bit, but just looking at the phases that they go through, the changes that their face goes through, just in three or four or five breaths as they're being witnessed begins to really help us understand how vulnerable we want to be as humans, how much we want to trust this vulnerability. And much of my work is online. We've had, I've had hundreds of thousands, millions of people have breathed with us at Alchemy of Breath. And it's, and and most of our outreach is online. And we all feel like a family because we feel safe. So I think the- And I just want to say something there, Anthony, because we've all done Zoom classes and this is very different than a Zoom class. People are lying on blankets, they're on sofas, they're in their bed, whatever. And it, it doesn't have the, sometimes when we're on a Zoom class, if it's a professional development course, people are more um, 
reserved or or just it doesn't feel intimate. But there is an intimacy created with the breath work where everybody's doing the breath work together, the way you play music to up the get people engaged. So it's a collective experience versus Zoom. I just really want to differentiate that between being on a Zoom professional development class. This is very experiential. And at the end, people are really supportive of each other and the shifts they've made, and it's very loving. It's it's just exquisite. It's just so beautiful. It tickles my fancy and makes me want to just do more. Right. It's so inspiring. And just one other on, on the other uh, key segment that you've also worked with the dying. Is there anything specific about the dying that uh, the breath work is specific to the dying? I'm working with a man. I can't remember the name of the deceased right now, but he is losing his muscle control, and eventually that will mean no breath. So the it's a diminishing ability to use his diaphragm. And this is a pretty classic example where we just practice not breathing enough. We begin to get used to greeting the feeling of needing more air with a sense of softening and relaxation instead of the normal tension that comes. So if you hold your breath, there's a time when you want to you want to breathe out, or if you hold it out, there's a time when you want to breathe in. So we're looking at that moment when that initial urge comes and learning to outweigh it with our ability to soften and relax. Mm -hmm. So the idea of this practice for this sweet man is that as breath becomes shorter, that he can understand that and learn to soften more rather than to go into trauma or panic over it. I just lost my dear sister-in-law three weeks ago, Sorry. and she was she has something called ascites, which is when you have cancer treatment and liquid starts to fill up your lungs, and she was unable to breathe, and exactly the same practice happened with her. But I've also seen miraculous changes with, with illnesses mm -hmm. of people understanding them in a more ample way than just chemotherapy and what medicine do I need to take. They begin to understand that this is really critical to, I think, to, I believe this 100%, is that most of the symptoms that uh, we experience, we don't notice until they become acute enough in order to gain our attention. And then we go seek help. But the more we breathe like this and the more we check into our body, the more we embody, we develop a relationship with our body as we breathe, these symptoms are actually declaring themselves much earlier on in blockages of energy. And because when you take on board all this energy, there's a lot, there's a lot flowing through your body. Sometimes you're trembling, sometimes your body locks up. There's all kinds of things that can happen. So when you start to notice these things and you start to inquire into the body, wow, I wonder what that might mean. Know that every trauma we've experienced is lodged in our body somewhere. And if, if we don't develop relationship with it, if we don't learn to listen early enough, that headache becomes a migraine, and then that becomes a t something even more serious, chronic, or whatever it might be. So we need to remind ourselves that our body is a living miracle organism that wants to be understood. Right. And breath work can actually, from what I'm understanding, can actually be preventative, getting the trauma out of the body before disease develops. If you're doing breath work on a continual basis, it's not accumulating and uh, accumulating and you're creating an inner peace so the body can get in a restful state before it goes into some chronic condition. Yeah, you nailed it. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I just wanted to ask you also, because of these isolating times, the power of you, we have three, 400 people sometimes on your Sunday, and I know you do breath camps, but can you talk about the power of community right now in this world and how it can really help us stay a little healthier or saner? I, yeah, and I would love to. This is my, this is really my true call in life is to create community and we use the breath to do that. But I believe that First of all, that community starts inside, that inner community of all of that orchestra. And that commitment to keep looking inside means that I can come to you and be real. I might be vulnerable, I might be hurting, I might be uh, happy, I might be joyful, but at least that I am able to be present with you. I'm not, my mind isn't trying to think of a way to answer you while you're talking to me. I can actually listen to you and receive what you're feeling and that will help you feel like you're seen and you're heard and that you are valuable yeah the power, yeah, of, presence, the power yes. of presence so what happens when we come together in this way is that we create this geezer of 
care, of human care and empathy and love and support. And that's what community is about to me. But it, it can't be really functional unless it comes from inside. If it comes from outside, it becomes by default this, you either belong to this thing or you don't. You're an insider or an outsider. And we get in back in, we fall back into the unconscious polarization that we are investing in unawares all the time seeking to oppose and cast our opinion and win and prove and convince. This is more about invitation. This is more about an invitation to look inside and to bring out your wholeness and your rawness, your brokenness as well. I love this quote related to this, Anthony, in your book. Unless we are able to witness, hold, and love our darker self, true healing and a return to wholeness cannot occur. The shadow realms might not be easy or pleasant to navigate, but with our newfound will to feel the feeling along with our awareness that all will pass, we can recognize that it is a risk worth taking if we wish to become all of who we can be. It's a very powerful quote in your book. Yeah, thank you. I I so feel that's true. And I I only know it because um, of having to love the darkness in my own being, which wasn't always easy. I think this, this, this theme of reclaiming innocence can apply to a murderer, but even a murderer has innocence in them. They might have committed a heinous act in one moment, but they were born a virgin child, and they were informed either before birth or after birth, and that information has made that act possible to happen. So I really believe as people who are involved in the healing arts, the prerequisite and the backbone of our training for facilitation is to learn to love ourselves. My, My goal is that each graduate of my work can sit alongside someone who is suicidal or dying and hates themselves and all of those things that we see in humanity And to be able to be present with that, not to hide from it. Anthony, are there any other closing words you have or any encouraging words for moving through this challenging time in history to stay centered in ourselves? I think the the wisest thing I can say uh, is that notice how you breathe. Just start noticing how you breathe. Notice how you breathe when you're happy or when you're sad or whether you're, you're stressed or when you're making love. Start to notice how you breathe. And know that this is the biggest tool you're ever going to discover in your life, the breath. Because as much as it is a symptom of the condition, you you can manipulate that symptom and change the condition that lies underneath. So if you're feeling stressed through this time with COVID and potential lockdowns, please address your anxiety with your breath. Anxiety is just energy. It's not personal. Imagine the power in anxiety if you could transform it into enthusiasm. And Fritz Perl said, he was the founder of Gestalt Therapy, he said that anxiety is enthusiasm without the breath. If you can breathe less than six times a minute, your anxiety will begin to drop. Very significant. Thank you so much, Anthony. It's been a thrill to have you here today. And again, to the listeners, there is free breath sessions every Sunday at alchemyofbreath.com to register. You register on Zoom. Many of his facilities he's trained lead the breath sessions, and occasionally we get a guest experience with Anthony. So thanks again, Anthony, for your time today. Thank you so much, Gail. It's been a joy to be with you. Thank you for joining me on our journey today. I am so grateful you are part of my podcast community, where it is my dream that by claiming our worthiness together, we can more impactfully shed our light and love on this world. In future podcasts, I'll be sharing more stories of hope and unlimited possibilities for creating anew. You can also follow me on Instagram or on my Facebook page. I also hope you'll be inspired to share my podcast with your friends. Together, we are stronger. Blessings, Gail. Instagram and Facebook at Coach Gail Jones.